Hello and welcome to LIFE 2021, to the program of LIFE 2021 and the webinar series. And today we have webinar number 11 out of the series of 18 webinars which we present over the year. So uh, current trends in nephrology is the overarching topic of this uh, program. And uh, today we are talking about COVID-19 and specific uh, topics around this area. My name is Christoph Wanner. I'm professor of medicine at the University Hospital in Würzburg, Germany. And I'm chairing this um, session together with my co-chair, Professor Peter Stenwinkel from the Karolinska Institute in Stockholm, Sweden. You as a participant, you are automatically muted and invisible, but you can ask questions at any time and you can go to the question box at the right uh, bottom, at the corner of the right side, at the bottom. So today is World Kidney Day and the overarching topic of World Kidney Day is living well with kidney disease. But living well with kidney disease means that, for example, as a dialysis patient, you need to be vaccinated. And this is our priority currently, to get people on dialysis into the vaccination programs with the highest priority. The president of the ASN, ISN and myself today have issued a press statement at 2 o'clock uh, Central European time, urging all governments to bring dialysis patients in the highest uh, program, uh, highest uh, priority layer, uh, that they get the vaccination, including staff and doctors of all dialysis programs. So it is very timely today that we have uh, the theme of the current webinar, uh, and I introduce Professor Kitty Jager from the AMC, Amsterdam Medisch Center, University Medical Center in the Netherlands. Kitty Jager is Professor of Epidemiology and Director of the ERA EDTA Registry. And she will talk about the uh, COVID-19 in the European Kidney Replacement Therapy population. And there are recent data which we will listen to. And it is followed by a talk of Dr. Raphael Duvenworden. He is from the Radbau University Medical Center in Nijmegen. And he will talk about the ERA EDTA registry, especially focus on the ERA CODA study group. So I think this is an exciting program, timely. It, it fits into the World Kidney Day, and I welcome Kitty Jager, and she will now uh, give her a lecture about the uh, COVID-19 topic. And uh, please, Kitty, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Christoph, for your kind introduction. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. I'm very happy to present the registry data on COVID-19. Before I do so, I would like to attract your attention to a public health perspective. This slide shows the results of a, a study from the UK that was done uh, in the first half of 2020 and that shows the risk of different groups in the general population to die from COVID-19. Now, as you can see here on top, there is a group uh, of uh, people that have CKD. And as you can see here, especially the people with a, an EGFR below 30 ml per minute have a more than two times as high risk of dying of, uh, from COVID-19 as any other in the population. This risk is even higher when they are on dialysis or when they have received a renal transplant. Now, what you can also see from this slide is that CKD as a risk factor is much more important for COVID-19 mortality than any of the other known risk factors. For example, severe obesity, diabetes, etc. 
People with CKD are definitely at risk of dying from COVID-19. Now, about a year ago, the ERA EDTA registry set out to investigate a 20 day uh, mortality after COVID-19 diagnosis in the European kidney replacement ther therapy population. And we also wanted to determine the role of patient characteristics, treatment factors and country on mortality risk. To this end, we collected data from uh, national registries in seven European countries. You can see them on the map. Um, and we did this for uh, the time period between February 1 and 30 April 2020. So this is the first half of the first wave of COVID-19. And what we wanted to do with these data was to calculate the COVID-19 attributable mortality risk. And we did this by calculating the mortality in COVID-19 patients and then subtracting the mortality in propensity score matched historic controls in the ERA EDTA registry. What did we find? Well, first of all, um, we had almost 3,300 3, dialysis patients. As you can see here, uh, the patients with the COVID-19 were about 2.9% 2, 2 of all prevalent dialysis patients. This is much higher as, for example, in the general population, where 0.3% of all people in the general population um, are infected with COVID-19. As you can see, the uh, mean age was almost 72 years. Two thirds of the people were above the age of 65. Um, two thirds were males and almost half of the people had uh, were on KRT due to diseases like diabetes and hypertension renal vascular disease. What you can also see at the bottom is that almost all patients were on hemodialysis. Then what was the mortality? You can see here that the mortality at 28 days was 21.2%. What you can also see is that mortality starts to level out around that time. So most of the mortality takes place in the first weeks after COVID-19 diagnosis. You can also see that this mortality is much higher than the 1.2% uh, of the expected mortality in this group, meaning that the COVID-19 attributable mortality was 20%. When you calculate this as a relative risk, this means that patients that were infected with COVID-19 had a, had a 21 point times higher mortality than those who are not infected with COVID-19. When we look at this um, mortality in different age categories, you can see the following. Above the age of 75 years old, 31% uh, of all patients died. What you can see here is the comparison between countries. The uh, yellow line are the Netherlands, which has the highest mortality of all, 30%. Whereas patients in Romania only had 9% uh, mortality. These are all univariate analyses. But when we go to the multivariable analysis, we can see that age was a very important risk factor for death of COVID-19 in dialysis patients. Those above 75 years of age had an almost four times as high mortality risk. Also, uh, men are at higher risk of uh, dying from COVID-19. And as far as the countries are concerned, we can see here that France and Romania have a lower risk of dying from COVID-19 than patients in Switzerland. Then we go to the transplant patients. More than 1,000 patients were included. 
Here you can see the percentage of patients, of transplant patients that were infected with COVID-19, 1.4%, which again is higher than the 0.3% in the general population. Uh, they were on average about 10, uh, 10 years younger than dialysis patients. Again, two thirds were male, but the percentage of patients with uh, diabetes and hypertension in the transplant patients was lower than those in the dialysis patients. Here again, you can see the mortality, uh, but then in the transplant recipients, it is almost similar to the mortality in dialysis patients. 20.2%. Um, what you can see here was that the expected mortality in similar transplant recipients was 0.2%, which means that the COVID-19 attributable mortality was almost 20%. But because the expected mortality risk in transplant, recip in transplant recipients is much lower than in dialysis patients, the relative risk is much higher. So transplant recipients with COVID-19 have an almost 93 times higher risk of dying than those without COVID-19. When we then look at the age categories, you can see a similar, but I think maybe a bit uh, more uh, severe picture. That is that in patients, in, in transplant recipients with COVID-19, the mortality in the age categories uh, 75 plus was 44%. So in that age category, almost half of the patients died. Here we had only data from Spain and France, and you can see that the mortality in Spain was higher than that in France. Again, these are univariate analyses, so let's have a look at the multivariable uh, analysis. Here you can see that patients over the age of 75 years uh, old, they have a more than five times higher risk of dying than those below 65 years of age. Um, in the multivariable analysis, uh, country was not in, um, uh, a risk factor and also not uh, gender was a risk factor. When we then compare the mortality risk in transplant recipients versus those in matched dialysis patients, we can see that the uh, risk of dying in transplant recipients was 28% higher than in dialysis patients. So what we can say from our data is that the incidence of COVID-19 in kidney replacement therapy patients is low, but it seems definitely higher than in the general population. In both dialysis and transplant patients, one fifth had died four weeks after diagnosis. And in dialysis, higher age, male sex and country were risk factors. In transplant patients, only age was a risk factor. Transplant recipients had a 28% higher risk of death than their dialysis counter uh, counterparts. And finally, roughly calculated, we estimated that the mortality in dialysis patients was twice as high as that in the general population with COVID-19 of similar age, whereas that of transplant recipients was six times as high uh, compared to the general population with uh, COVID-19 of similar age. However, we should keep in mind that even in population-based registries like the ERA EDTA registry, the COVID-19 patients reported may not, may not re represent all KRT patients with COVID-19 as the majority of infections are asymptomatic or low or mild. Secondly, in the first wave, routine testing was likely to be more common in hemodialysis patients, whereas in transplant recipients, this may have been restricted to a symptomatic population and therefore representing a sicker group um, and therefore resulting in a higher mortality. I will come back to that in my next slide. 
um, we should also keep in mind that 20% of the diagnosed patients died. But this also means that 80% of them survived at least up to four weeks. And finally, we cannot draw any conclusions on country differences because a lot of the variation may be due to differences in identification of cases. You may remember that during the first wave in lots of countries, there were shortages of testing material, and this may have deferred between countries. So we cannot interpret any mortality differences between countries. Um, secondly, there may have been severity, uh, difference in severity of infections. And of course, we were not able to adjust for unmeasured country and patient level confounders. So the question is, why is mortality higher in transplant recipients compared with dialysis patients? Well, part of the answer, I think, is given by the, ER, by the IRACODA database, another registry that is being supported by ERA EDTA. What you can see here is that from the patients in IRACODA, the transplant recipients were more often identified on the basis of symptoms compared to dialysis patients. You can also see that the number of symptoms in transplant recipients was higher than in dialysis patients. For example, more patients had shortness of breath, uh, more patients had fever, uh, more patients had myalgia or atralgia, and Last but not least, their CRP was higher than that in dialysis patients. So I think we can definitely conclude that at presentation with COVID-19, transplant patients seem sicker than dialysis patients. Thank you for your attention. So uh, thank you, Kitty. Um, your work was well appreciated in the community and uh, has been published already, as you pointed out, in Kidney International. So I think we um, will discuss uh, both talks together at the end. And uh, I want to ask the audience again to ask your questions in the chat function box uh, on the right bottom corner. And please type them in and we can then come back to your question at the end and have uh, ample time to respond to them. So I'm coming um, to the next talk from Dr. Raphael Duivenworden from Neymagen University Hospital. And uh, as I pointed out, he will focus on ERA, the ERA CODA study, the overview of the first results and what can be learned from different approaches on COVID-19. And Raphael, you also may tell us during your talk or later we can discuss how your group was formed and how the study is uh, ongoing. So thank you. And please uh, go ahead. The floor is yours. Please. Thank you so much uh, for your kind introduction. And um, um, I would like to start off with um, um, showing our data on the, uh, from the ERA EDTA, uh, from the ERA CODA uh, collaboration. So back in March um, 2020, so now exactly a year ago, um, the pandemic uh, was starting um, or had started and uh, was having a lot of effect throughout Europe um, and obviously throughout the world. And we felt really the necessity and the urgency to collect data on our patient populations, so patients on kidney replacement therapy uh, to understand uh, what was happening to our patients because at the time we had little information. We did not know whether they were at increased risk um, and, um, and what was their faith. Um, so um, under the um, uh, guidance of, uh, uh, of uh, Luc Hilbrands from uh, Radboud University in Nijmegen and also Ram Gansevoort from the uh, University of Groningen in, uh, in the Netherlands, um, this uh, this uh, 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 yeah this endeavor was started, um, and how it worked. What we what we really aim to do is capture as much as uh, uh, data uh, as possible from from each individual patient. So we uh, made a database based on 
a, a, a big questionnaire basically that each um, a physician uh, of a patient could fill in um, and really provide uh, very detailed data on, on the patients. Um, and uh, obviously we wanted to be informed uh, about risk factors for mortality, uh, risk factors for being admitted to the intensive care unit, um, and, um, 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 and, and, and yeah, really to understand uh, the clinical course of the disease in these patients. Now, <clears throat> fast forward uh, to February uh, this year, we now have included um, over 3,500 patients into this uh, registry. Um, and uh, uh, about 30% of those are uh, uh, renal transplant patients and 70% are dialysis patients. Um, over 200 physicians throughout Europe uh, have uh, filled in data on patients. So that's a, a very big effort from a lot of uh, uh, colleagues um, uh, across 125 centers and 30 countries, uh, which are mainly in Europe, but also some around the Mediterranean uh, Sea um, that have uh, helped uh, to enter data. Um, now, in our first publication, we were interested in uh, the uh, mortality rate of uh, COVID-19 uh, uh, um, infected uh, patient, dialysis patient and kidney transplant patients. And I will go over these data briefly. Um, and the first thing is that we observed that, uh, which is not a, not a surprise, obviously, that age is a big risk factor for mortality, um, both in the dialysis and the transplant patients. Um, and also uh, frailty. And it is important to note that the distribution of, uh, of, of patients um, is not similar. Uh, so uh, there are more patients uh, that are of higher age in the dialysis group as compared to the transplant group. And also people on dialysis have a higher frailty score as compared to people on transplantation, which is uh, something that we all know that people on transplantation are uh, generally a bit younger and a bit more uh, vivid, basically, um, and uh, therefore have a different, uh, the, these groups are very different. Now, in, the, in these bars, we see the data on the mortality. And on the left side, you see the data for the dialysis patients, which are a bit over 700 patients. And um, on the right side in blue, you see the kidney transplant patients, which is a little bit over 300. Now, we see here that um, on the bottom, we made three age groups. And uh, on the side, we made uh, three groups for frailty. Uh, and this is a clinical frailty score, which basically means whether you are uh, very viable, walking around, uh, very independent, or whether you are, uh, well, indeed very frail and um, have difficulty in mobility, but also on uh, maybe on other aspects. And we see here that with increasing age, but also with increasing uh, frailty, uh, the risk of, um, uh, of mortality once you contract COVID is uh, much uh, higher than uh, for the younger and less frail uh, patients. And these mortality rates are actually uh, quite high, as you see here. Um, for the kidney transplant patients, the, um, uh, the, this, these, these bars are pretty much uh, show pretty much the same uh, same thing. You see that with the older patients, mortality is much higher uh, than in the younger patients, and the frailty um, also has this uh, this slope. Um, and uh, this is not a surprise. If we look at the mortality uh, over time, and these are data that are uh, very much I like, I think, uh, from the data that were just shown uh, by Professor De Jager, that over time, you see that mortality and also ICU admission uh, levels off uh, uh, at about uh, 28 days. Um, we see that um, more transplant patients were admitted to the ICU than dialysis patients which could be because they were more ill, but it could also be uh, somewhat biased because perhaps uh, uh, they were a bit younger, they were uh, less frail and they were more likely to be admitted because they uh, were believed to have better chances with an ICU admission. 
The mortality is pretty close together uh, in our data here. Uh, so the dialysis patient had a mortality of 25% and a transplant patient of 21%, which is actually um, quite similar to the data just shown uh, from the uh, area uh, EDTA registry. But keep in mind that the frailty of the transplant patients and the age of the transplant patients is different. So in fact, if we are going to correct for uh, these factors, uh, so comorbidities and age and gender, um, then things start to appear uh, to be a little bit different. Um, and you see that the kidney transplant patients have a higher mortality as compared to the hemodialysis patients. Now here I show an updated version of the data that we have uh, published uh, in December. Um, and um, uh, had obviously more patients entered into the registry. So I wanted to show you the, the last results basically. And um, so this is on a, uh, based on a bigger group. Um, and uh, we see that there's a 39% increase in risk uh, uh, for the kidney transplant patients as compared to the hemodialysis patients. And um, uh, when we do the same analysis for people that were only screened because of symptoms, and we can still see that there's a marked increase, uh, increased risk for kidney transplant patients. And this is obviously an important uh, uh, analysis to do because um, as also Professor Jager just showed, it could be that dialysis patients are screened. Uh, um, they are three times per week in the hospital. Uh, maybe they're screened for uh, other reasons than uh, being uh, symptomatic. Um, and that this may, may in, uh, affect the results. But here you can see uh, that um, really the increased uh, risk for mortality um, is, is true for kidney transplant patients. So these data really corroborate what we've seen before. And our question was, uh, well, if kidney transplant patients seem to be at higher risk, um, even though that they're uh, younger and uh, less frail um, and we affect for these uh, things, well, then it must have something to do. There are not much, much other uh, variables different from these groups. So it must have something to do with the immunosuppression, which makes sense because it's an infection related uh, uh, mortality. So to further understand this, we looked at um, a different, we, we performed a different analysis. Um, and uh, this is also an analysis that was uh, done on the latest set of data that we have uh, just recently. And what we did here is we wanted to uh, compare patients that are um, on the waiting list uh, to receive a transplant. Um, so they could get a transplant at any moment uh, to patients that have been just transplanted uh, in the past year. So these patients must be in terms of uh, clinical characteristics, uh, uh, pretty similar. Um, and the thing is that in the first year after transplantation, obviously you get the most uh, medications for immunosuppression. Um, so this may give us a clear view on whether immunosuppression is, um, um, is hazardous um, in case of mortality for COVID-19. And here we see, we made a, a four uh, models for adjusting for uh, confounders. And you can see that in all these models, uh, the kidney transplant patients have a four to five times uh, higher risk of mortality as compared to the hemodialysis patients. And also when we do this analysis again, for people that are screened because of symptoms, you can still see that this increased risk uh, is still very much visible. So this really shows that, or from this data, we think we can infer that the, the, the immunosuppression may play an important role. Now the next question is, is the amount of immunosuppression that someone uh, receives um, uh, important or is the type of immunosuppression important for mortality? So here we performed an analysis to um, um, assess uh, uh, patients on triple therapy uh, and compare them to transplant patients on dual therapy uh, to see if, if any of those uh, show a difference. But we actually, uh, and perhaps maybe to, a little bit to our surprise, do not see a difference in, um, in these groups. Why may this be? Well, perhaps it could be because patients on dual therapy are perhaps on dual therapy for a reason. Perhaps they already were known to have more infections or 
Um, there, perhaps there are other reasons there, uh, uh, why they are on dual therapy instead of triple therapy. Um, so this may indeed, um, um, yeah, maybe a different, uh, they may be uh, less comparable in that sense. But at least we do not see a clear uh, uh, difference in the total amount of immunotherapy. A monotherapy group obviously was not included because there were very few people on a monotherapy. In this analysis, we aimed to look at the type of immune suppression. So we made three groups, um, patients that were either on uh, corticosteroids or not, uh, a, a, a calcineurin inhibitor uh, or not, or a uh, antimetabolite or not. And um, obviously, if you do not take prednisone, you probably do take uh, uh, tacrolimus or, uh, or uh, mycophenolate. Uh, so that, that, there, there's some uh, some difference in there. So we also adjusted for that in this uh, in this third model. And what we really see across these different groups, um, and you can do all kinds of or types of analysis uh, that I'm not showing here, but uh, they all kind of point into the same direction that we do not see a clear um, signal that any of the types of immunosuppressants is more hazarded than another type of immunosuppressant. Um, so these are, uh, I think, important, uh, important data um, to show that the total amount and also the type of immunosuppressant do not really uh, change the risk of mortality from COVID-19 in transplant patients. So the last question is, or one of the questions that arise is, well, if transplant patients are so much at so much uh, higher risk, uh, especially in their first year after transplantation, as compared to the patients on the waiting list for dialysis, shouldn't we have that risk is about four to five times higher? Shouldn't we stop transplanting our patients? Um, and for this, we have to keep in mind that we can't really answer the, these questions with the data that we have gathered in the uh, ERICO the database because there is a risk of contracting the infection but there's also a risk of dying once you are infected and the data that we have gathered in the ERICO the database is the risk of dying once you have uh, uh, contracted the infection but obviously we should keep in mind that when the risk of contracting an infection is very low then the overall risk uh, will also be very low and when the risk of contracting the infection increases, the overall risk also increases. So we need to have a better view on these numbers. And one interesting uh, publication in this regard uh, was recently publish published by Clark and his co-workers. And um, what they did is they analyzed uh, people uh, from their center um, that um, uh, so basically they, they looked at all of their uh, dialysis and all of their kidney transplant patients and they looked at the number of contracting the infection and also the risk of dying once you have uh, contracted the infection and what they saw is um, and I see that the somehow the uh, the, the labels are, are gone here but basically what they saw is that the a risk of contracting the infection uh, was much lower in the uh, transplant patients as compared to the dialysis patients. In once you contract the infection in the transplant patients, the risk of dying is much higher when compared to the dialysis patients. But you can see that these numbers, if you really calculate them together, then in fact um, the uh, total risk. Uh, does not change. So here you see this in the in these bars. So the risk of contracting the infection, and so this is the the risk of um, of contracting it, is much uh, lower in the transplant patient than in the dialysis patients on the waiting list. Well, but the overall risk of uh, dying from COVID is very similar. So this means that probably the patients on the waiting list on dialysis. They have to go three times to, uh, per week to the uh, dialysis center, and they may not be able to shield themselves from the infection. Um, while the transplant patients, they are very much aware, and I also see this in my own uh, patient group, 
Um, they are very much aware of their increased risk. They shield themselves very effectively and uh, they keep this number uh, at the front down uh, so that the overall number also goes down. This may obviously change or be different across uh, centers, across countries, across uh, regional areas, uh, because once there is an outbreak on your uh, dialysis ward, well, then your risk as a dialysis patient increases a lot. Uh, when you don't have uh, an outbreak on your dialysis ward, uh, well, then your uh, uh, risk may not be as high. So that may have uh, a lot of regional changes or differences. So overall, what I wanted to share with you is that the ERICODA uh, is a database. Uh, ERICODA database is set up uh, to reinvestigate the clinical course of the and the outcomes of our kidney replacement uh, patients with uh, COVID-19. Um, we I showed you that the COVID-19 related mortality is substantially higher, about six, uh, four to six times in transplant patients in their first year after transplantation as, as compared to the patients, hemodialysis patients on the waiting list. The increased mortality in renal transplant patients does not seem to be related to the amount, but also not to the type of immunosuppression, which to me is actually uh, reassuring. Um, and uh, despite the increased case fatality rate in uh, renal transplant patients, um, the renal transplant patient may in fact be, have the advantage of shielding themselves more effectively in comparison to dialysis patients. And this is also, I think, important um, in the context at the moment when uh, vaccination programs are rolled out uh, in a lot of nations and also in the Netherlands. Um, that these dialysis patients, they really need to be vaccinated because they uh, do not have the ability to shield themselves effectively. Um, transplant patients obviously also need to be uh, um, vaccinated because they, once they contract the disease, uh, uh, they have uh, an increase, a much increased uh, mortality. Um, and, um, and there's one thing that I wanted to emphasize, um, and this is more from a personal uh, experience basically, uh, but what I really want to highlight here is that it is that what I showed you is about maintenance in immunosuppression and not about anti T cell anti rejection therapy. Um, for these uh, type of uh, immunosuppressants, we don't have enough uh, uh, large enough numbers to really draw conclusions. Um, but I do see in my personal uh, experience that, uh, for example, people that have received ATG or, uh, or alemtuzumab. Um, have a very um, uh, um, a severe uh, form of COVID-19. So they may at least, uh, those immunosuppression may indeed be uh, related to increased risk, but we don't have the numbers for that. This is what I wanted to share you. And um, I really want to, uh, well, also obviously uh, thank all the people that have done a lot of work. Ron Ganders, Wort, Luc Hilbrands, Kitty Diagers included in here as well, uh, has done a lot of work. Uh, so um, I want to thank them all as well. Good. Thank you, Dr. Drivenworden. I think important data also underlining the high risk of our patients and the necessity for vaccination, as you told us. Yeah. Yeah. So I again uh, address the audience that you still can type in your questions and we will respond to them. And while I'm waiting for your question, then you can um, continue. So please, um, we get the questions from um, the central, from the center, and you can read them. I will read them for you. The first one is to Professor Yaga. You have shown that data were collected from real registry of seven European countries. Which were the main obstacles to gain the information from other registry as well? Does this situation improve in time? I think you were very fast in collecting this data and therefore you selected. Or how, how did you do this? Well, I think we were very lucky that uh, um, uh, while thinking that it would be a good idea to collect data from these patients, uh, some of the national registries had in fact already started collecting the data. And um, I think that the, the renal registries that were included belong to, how should I say, the, the most efficient registries in this regard in Europe. 
Um, for the others, it 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 was more uh, uh, problematic. Uh, I'm not sure what the reasons were behind their um, their uh, in, inability to provide fast data. Yeah, I think it has to do with the contact with your centers, how motivated people are over there to participate in uh, data collection. And obviously, these countries were in, in, the, in the forefront of this. So f finally, does this situation improve in time, uh, with me, which means uh, in about two or three years from now, when you have collected everything, maybe you'll get the information from all countries? Is this feasible, do you think? I, I, think, I think indeed that countries will have started to, um, uh, how do you say that, to a label in, in, in their database to label those patients that have contracted COVID-19. So over time, these patients will keep that label and then we will be able to follow them uh, in a retrospective uh, study, including far more countries than we had uh, last year. Thank you. May I have the next question then? And uh, next one is again uh, going to Professor Jager. Uh, how do you explain the higher number of patients diagnosed in age of 45 to 64 in Romania comparing to the other countries? Um, well, I think in general, uh, countries like Romania uh, are a bit more selecti selective when they put patients on kidney replacement therapy. Uh, that is what you see in most uh, Eastern European countries that in general, the uh, uh, KRT populations are much younger than those in the Western European countries. So um, I was not very surprised to see that also the COVID-19 patients were much younger than uh, uh, compared to those in Western European countries. I think when you did the multivariate analysis, the country effect went away. At least you told us in transplant, but uh, did it also go away in the dialysis population, the country the effect? In, in the dialysis patients, in the, in, the... in the dialysis patients, both France and Romania had a slightly lower mortality risk than com compared to patients in Switzerland. But as I tried to stress at the end of my presentation, we don't think that uh, these differences in mortality risk between countries are real. We think they are. Uh, the result of uh, uh, different uh, testing strategies, especially in the first wave of COVID-19. Uh, some countries started to routinely screen their dialysis patients very early, others started only later, and then you already induce a number of differences, a sort of selection bias, as a result of which you cannot really anymore uh, compare the uh, mortality risks. Uh, yes, I take the next question, but also have one to Dr. Raphael Dovenworden. Um, I saw that the point estimates of the triple versus the dual point, uh, the dual comparison, immunosuppressive medication, the point estimates were already on the left of unity around 0.81 which gives me an impression maybe there the immunosuppression has an effect and maybe we had you had not enough patience or power to show this what is your feeling about this yes this is a very good question and uh, that is also something that we uh, questioned ourselves is this a a, a power issue um and actually, um, if you look at the data, the, the confidence interval is very large. It's very wide. So what we did is we contacted colleagues from the Washington University in the United States that have a similar type of database. Obviously, in a different continent, they have uh, had perhaps some differences in their healthcare system. And they have different patients with more obesity and more diabetes. 
um, but still uh, I think very uh, uh, useful to compare these data and we um, asked them to look at their data in the same way as we did it and they found exactly the same that there was no real difference um, in uh, between these uh, dual therapy uh, um, so so at least it, it could be that if you have a lot more patients that at some point you uh, can narrow down these confidence interval and find some effect. Um, but our database and together with the database from Washington University, it's quite a lot of patients and we, we can't find it. May, may I comment on that? Uh, maybe, maybe uh, Raphael, you, you, you may also um, tell the audience about the previous findings where you were able to show a difference between dual and triple therapy. Yeah, that is that is interesting indeed too, and that is also still data that we are looking into. So over time, um, it seems that in the beginning um, of the uh, pandemic, or so on the earlier data, we could find some difference uh, in 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 the dose of immunosuppression. So the dual therapy versus the triple therapy, uh, in which the dual therapy uh, was associated with lower risk of mortality. Uh, but over time, and as we gather more data, uh, this difference disappeared. And it could be, but we are still looking into these uh, these data that that the, also the, uh, the there's something changed in the first wave versus the second wave of COVID-19 patients. This could be related to um, which type of patients were uh, uh, were diagnosed with uh, uh, because testing was more available later on than maybe in the earlier days. Um, or that, uh, um, or maybe because of it, another difference. Uh, but we did see it in the beginning, so that's why we also thought it would be interesting to follow this up and and analyze this. But it, it, over time, uh, this difference disappeared. Yeah. Okay. Can I have the next question from the center again to you, uh, Raphael? How do you think what was on first place? The cause of death among transplanted patients, cytokine storm, bacterial infections. Can, could you identify this from the data you collected? This is indeed a very interesting question. Uh, this is not something that we could identify from our data uh, because the data that we gathered um, are really on, uh, on, on, uh, on clinical parameters. Um, these included also uh, parameters and questions like uh, upon presentation, whether a patient had lymphopenia or uh, other uh, laboratory results. But these are uh, questions that you cannot really infer um, uh, as detailed the, the pathophysiology um, uh, of the cause of death of these, these patients. Um, I think it is a very interesting uh, topic of research um, um, and also in our center we are looking at this uh, um, um, and um, we we there are some some interesting thoughts there but i cannot get it out of this database basically good we have many more questions so let's look at the next one and uh, so dr rafael does the era coda collect information on vaccination any results so far? Yeah, so this is a, a very interesting topic. Um, uh, we don't have results uh, so far on this uh, uh, topic, but um, there is also a, uh, uh, a large effort being done uh, to collect data uh, on vaccination. Uh, uh, but this is in a different uh, uh, registry, basically. Uh, and uh, But this is indeed uh, being set up and very important uh, uh, registry as well. Yeah, because we need to know how effective so, it is. Yeah, let, let's formulate the research question. Uh, do you think um, maybe the registry or both are able to answer the question one time, the proportion of patients getting infected during the first wave is uh, higher than the proportion of patients in the second wave because dialysis centers may have learned to shield the patient? And then are there still infections during the third 
period where most patients are vaccinated because we do not know how the vaccination works and uh, to what percentage patients are protective. So do you think one time you could distinguish, let's say in two years, the three uh, periods of time? I think we will be able to see that in 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 our database, yes. Um, once all the registries have flagged uh, the patients with COVID-19, we can exactly see the date of diagnosis. So, uh, and then we, and we can compare that to the number of patients on dialysis and the number of patients on uh, transplantation. So, we would be able to um, to give some information on the percentage of patients infected in the first, second, and third wave. But that's for the future. Yeah, I think also that that is um, very interesting. But I think I, I assume uh, or expect that we will see a big difference after the uh, so in the in the third uh, uh, period, basically in the uh, post vaccination period, uh, when people will um, be less um, probably if they get COVID, less ill, uh, less needed to hospitalize them, less needed to uh, to admit them to the ICU unit. Um, I think these data will become very visible. So I take the next question. That to Professor Jager. Can you comment on the type of dialysis treatment, hemodial filtration or hemodialysis uh, in your Iracoda data, maybe this uh, goes uh, to more to Dr. Doevenwarden. Do you collect the data, hemodial, hemodial filtration, hemodialysis? Yeah, or so both this, of I you understand. will comment. Yeah, I understand this question. Is, it's, it is indeed an interesting one. Uh, we do not collect um, the type of hemodialysis. So uh, obviously we do collect whether they are on peritoneal dialysis or hemodialysis. Uh, we collect how long they have been on hemodialysis uh, and all kinds of parameters related to that, but uh, not the type of uh, 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 the technique of the hemodialysis. So we do not have this data, unfortunately. Yeah. But but I think in both registries, both the ERA ADTA registry and ERA CODA, it is quite obvious that the uh, uh, number of uh, peritoneal dialysis patients is much lower. Yeah. than that of hemodialysis patient it you can it, it you know it it's it's logical i think because like transplant recipients uh the chance of infection for pd patients is much lower than in hemodialysis patients that that go to a dialysis patients uh, to a dial dialysis center a number of times a week so pd patients is definitely lower Okay, thank you. Next uh, question. So again, uh, from Ira Kodia, could you comment on transplantation data related to lining donor, lining up donor transplant versus cadaver uh, kidneys? Cadaver yeah, so cadaver, so yeah. probably uh, what is meant here, whether the donor is uh, living or a post-mortal donor or deceased donor, um, we did not see um, uh, much difference there in, in terms of uh, mortality. Um, I think the mortality, I, I think these two groups are not entirely the same. Um, the, uh, I think the living donor transplantation tend to be a little bit younger um, uh, sometimes also um, they have a, uh, a more social structure around them uh, often uh, perhaps they uh, are less frail um, so they may not be exactly the same but we did not see uh, huge differences in, uh, in, this re in this respect living versus cadaveric yeah if, if you, if you um, adjust for these confounding factors obviously I mean if you wouldn't adjust then yeah. there, there could be a, a a difference, yeah. So uh, the audience wants to know on several questions, what is the difference between uh, ERA EDTA registry and ERA CODA database? 
uh, why, why, uh, what different data do you collect? So that's a good maybe question. So maybe, maybe starts first. Can start, you? Yeah. yeah. No, maybe Professor Jager can start first. Um. Well, I think the big difference is, is that the ERA EDTA registry collects data from national registries. And those national registries uh, collect data on kidney replacement therapy patients on a population-based basis. So that means that all patients in the country that are on KRT, they are, they are, those data are collected. And um, that is different in, in, in Iracoda, that, that is more a sample of all patients that are on KRT and are infected with COVID-19. And the second huge difference is that the ERA EDTA registry only collects a core data set, whereas Iracoda collects a much more extensive a data set with all kinds of clinical data related to COVID-19. And that is what the ERA EDTA registry does not have. It would also be, how do you say that, impossible to collect those data from all patients in all countries. That is much easier in the ERA CODA database. Yeah, so in that sense, they're, they're very much complementary, I think, these databases. And um, it, it's, it, it provides an interesting, uh, different uh, view in that sense, different data. So the Iracoda database um, has uh, a, lot, a lot of variables. Sorry, because we can think upfront all kinds of parameters that we would like to, to ask uh, to the physicians that type in the data. Um, but we do not have data on the patient that didn't present themselves with COVID-19. Um, so we only have data, uh, the granular data on the patient that did present. And that is different from the, um, from the registry. Yeah. yeah, indeed, that, that is another big difference. Uh, in the ERA EDTA registry, we are able to compare COVID-19 infected patients with non, with, yeah. with, with non-infected patients. Uh, so we have controls, and for that reason, we were able to calculate COVID-19 attributable mortality. That would never have been able, uh, never have been possible in the ERA-CODA database. So I fully agree with Raphael Duivervoorden. These two databases are complementary, and we can uh, uh, draw different conclusions from the two registries. So uh, at the end of our seminar, maybe uh, Kitty Jager, you uh, will take you will take the opportunity to thank your huge network of ERAED registry in Europe, and um, I give you also Raphael Duvinwarden a chance maybe to motivate another group of physicians who want to contribute because I think you are still open to accept databases. So let's start, Kitty, first. Yes. Thank you very much for the opportunity, Christoph. Yes, indeed, I would like to thank all the national registries and all the people in the different renal centers for the collection of ERA EDTA registry, not only for the COVID-19 uh, uh, patients, but for all patients. It provides us with a very good opportunity to uh, study the outcomes and to internationally compare the outcomes of kidney replacement therapy, including those of kidney uh, of COVID-19 infected patients over time. It will, they will also provide us with the opportunity to follow those patients over time. So let's say in two or three years, uh, we can tell you much more about uh, the long-term mortality of these patients, whether increased mortality during a particular period was followed by a lower mortality later on. So there are all kinds of, of interesting research questions left that we can report on. Thank you very much, all of you. Yes, and I also would like to thank all of the, uh, the physicians that have, have typed in the data of their patients. I think it's uh, really uh, astonishing. It has been really inspiring for myself to see in such a short amount of time, uh, so many people across Europe pulling together to gather these data. And, um, and actually this makes a big difference. Um, 
having these data, uh, both from our registry and the, the registry that, that uh, uh, Kit Diaga just, just showed us, these data are fundamental uh, to inform our policymakers on the risks that our patients uh, are, are on, um, how important it is to shield, how important it is to be vaccinated. Um, um, and so these data are really fundamental uh, for, for policymaking, for informing our patients, for informing uh, physicians across Europe and the world for that matter. Uh, so I think it's really inspiring that, that everybody uh, put in so much effort to, to join us and, uh, and collect these data. Uh, we are still open. Uh, uh, you can go to the uh, visit the Erecoda uh, website, which is www.erecoda.org. Uh, you can register uh, patients if you would like. And, um, and um, indeed, I would like to thank everybody that did. And I would like to thank you for joining us today and uh, giving us uh, original data which uh, are still unpublished or going to be published. This was beautiful. So thank you again, Professor Kitty Jager and Dr. Raphael Doevenborden. Thank you. And to the audience, maybe you are also interested uh, to have to uh, rethink uh, the messages and the data we have seen today and to have this data. And actually you can, because all these materials is posted on the website and even going into YouTube after a certain time when the lectures are prepared. So you can actually use these data maybe on your country level to convince uh, policymakers and decision uh, people who can decide to bring the patients in the highest priority for vaccination. So um, we are coming to end to the end of this webinar, and I want to announce the next one, number 12. It is going to happen on April 8th. And uh, Dr. Lily Chan will talk about machine learning in nephrology and uh, big databases. So thank you for uh, listening to this uh, webinar today and see you next time. Goodbye.